we had a couple of hours off, and now we're back into the, uh, into the metabolomics. So as I said this morning, lecture three is about informatics. So it's just giving you enough information to be comfortable with some of the analyses that are typically performed in metabolomics research. And I'm going to start, before I go into the, the various components of this next lecture, I just want to start with a quick definition on what bioinformatics is, because people have different views on what bioinformatics is. These days, it's an extremely important component of biosciences research. Um, if you're a trained bio bioinformatician, you'll probably have a, about um, a, a wide range of jobs that you could apply for. So recruiting bioinformaticians is really, really challenging because there's such a high demand for them. So bioinformatics is the application and development of computing and maths and um, statistics as well within there for managing, analyzing, and understanding biological data to solve biological questions. So it isn't just statistics, it isn't just managing data, it's not just analysing data, it's really the, um, a much larger field of science, and a very, very active, a very large, very active field of, uh, field of science. By the way, the slides are now on um, Canvas. I had an email to say that they've been uploaded. So I'm going to be talking about bioinformatics. I'm particularly talking about the, the, the analysis of metabolomics data, obviously in the context of this, this lecture. So what we're going to do is break this up into four parts. The fourth part is tiny. It's literally two slides, I think. So pretty much all of the next uh, lecture is going to be looking at different statistical approaches that people use. And I'm not going into any detail. I'm not trying to train you how to use these statistical approaches. And I'm not going to go into any statistical theory or anything like that. I mean, this is meant to be quite a practical look at these approaches, such that when you see these methods being used, if you're reading research papers or other applications in metabolomics, you, um, you're comfortable with what some of the approaches are. And I've broken it down into, first section is just going to be um, relatively few slides on univariate statistics. And then the bulk of the lecture is going to be on what's called unsupervised multivariate statistics, and I'll explain what all this is when we get there, including this technique called PCA, or Principal Components Analysis. And then a, a few slides on supervised multivariate statistical analysis. And there's another analysis method that we use a lot called partial least squares, and I'll just spend a few slides looking at that. And then I'll finish with just talking about databases and data standards for metabolomics. How... I, I would guess that most of you have used univariate statistics for, at some point. You know, you've done t-tests and ANOVAs at some point, right, in your projects, probably. I'm seeing several nodding heads. Have any of you used multivariate statistics? One... Two, two, couple of people. Okay. I mean, again, it's a bit like the question I asked this morning. I always get the same answer each year. Many people have had some training in univariate statistics. Um, very, very few people have had any exposure to multivariate statistics. The difference being, and I'll, I'll say it now, although I'll cover it again later, but it's sort of obvious. Univariate means you're analyzing or you're conducting statistics on one variable. So if we said, are men taller than women, and we use you as the representative group, and we, we, we measure your well, height as the variable, of course, that we're, that's our data is all based around height, and we do a statistical test, um, it would be a, a t-test to look for differences in height. So univariate means uni a single variable. And that's a whole branch of statistics focused on univariate. Multivariate means multiple variables. So if we were, maybe if we were assessing our health and we wanted to measure all sorts of parameters on our whole bunch of medical parameters, this would be multivariate data. I'm smiling because the obvious example here is metabolomics data. In metabolomics, if we measure 100 metabolites or 1,000 metabolites, we actually have a data on 1,000 variables. 
So this is clearly multivariate data. Mul metabolomics is multivariate data because it has mul multiple variables. So that's the general breakdown of, of, of the sections for today's first lecture. A little bit of background before I jump in to, to some detail here. Um, I'm not teaching you about something called spectral processing, so I wanted to put it onto a slide, because it's quite a big topic in itself. When you have decided on your experimental design, you selected that you're going to use, let's say, mass spectrometry as your analysis tool, when that instrument actually collects the data, we'd call that raw data, so it might be NMR data, mass spec data, there is an awful lot that we do to that data before we are ready to do statistical analysis. And that awful lot of stuff, I'm calling here spectral processing, and it includes things like peak picking, normalization, batch correction, variant scaling, missing value imputation. There's just a huge long list of different uh, operations we have to conduct. And again, it's a fairly big research area. I think my group alone has probably published about 10 papers on spectral processing in the last uh, five or six years. So there's a lot of development around how best to do this, but I'm not talking to you about that at all today. It gets into, it goes neatly into detail. So we click stuff for stuff. We click data on instruments. We process it. Don't worry about the details of that at all. And then we end up with what we can consider as process metabolomics data. And this lecture now is all about how we take processed data and we apply different types of statistics to analyze that data and, and derive information from that. So I'm only focusing on the second half of this workflow. And again, before going into the detail, just a reminder, you know, I showed you that slide this morning, all those 12 spectra. Um, these are actually NMR spectra. And you're, I mean, this is really pixelated and very low resolution, but now that you know they're NMR spectra, if you look around the middle of the spectrum, you see that broad hump. Again, that's, that's a lot of sugars giving rise to that. So this is a chemical shift of about 4 ppm. So this morning I was showing you this, and I said we're, we look for patterns, and your brain can look at that and go, well, 10 of them are really similar, the top two are different. And as I said this morning, we, we of course don't do this um, visually. We use um, algorithms, um, statistical analyses, in order to determine the differences between multiple, multiple spectra. Your brain's actually incredibly powerful at um, pattern recognition, way more powerful than any of the algorithms that we can use. But if you have... 100, 200, 300, 400 of those spectra, you can't lay out 400 spectra and hope your brain can actually distinguish between you know, all 400. So your brain's extremely powerful at looking at patterns, but um, it's the amount of data that, that makes it completely unfeasible to do it by any other way than by uh, using computers. So much of the statistical analysis we is to try and say in a quantitative, more robust way, compare those 12, the top one is different, the second one is different, and the 3 through 12 are much more similar. And that's it's the statistical approaches to do that that I'll be introducing you to today. So, a few slides on univariate statistics. I explain what univariate and multivariate are right at the beginning, because I wanted to immediately sort of challenge you to think, why would we use univariate statistics when our data is multivariate? When we collect metabolomics data, we're collecting hundreds, thousands, many thousands of peaks, and we're doing it across large numbers of samples. These are very large data sets. It's not a univariate data set. It's a multivariate data set. So... It's, it's fair to ask the question, how relevant is this? Should, should we even use multivariate statistics? And it's quite interesting how the different um, groups working in different fields will adopt practice 
in different areas of statistics. Let me be very specific with what I mean by that. If you look at the transcriptomics community, when that community started, and for the next at least 10 years, they applied univariate statistics. And that's pretty much all they applied. They did not apply multivariate statistics. When the field of metabolomics started, and it's a very different group of people that started working metabolomics compared to working in transcriptomics, very different group of people. Every metabolomics group in the first five years was driven with chemists because they needed to be experts in the tools. So it was chemists, chemists, chemists dominating metabolomics. If you look at all the early work, at least the first five years in metabolomics, all the data analysis was done using multivariate statistics and nobody used univariate statistics. So you had a complete, um, not disagreement as such, but one, one community using one tool used one branch of statistics and another community using another tool used a completely different branch of statistics. And it's largely because, I don't know if you're, hopefully you're far enough along in your education to, to start having your eyes open to this stuff, but most people, even in academia, are sheep, and they will follow what's published in the previous paper. And you remember I mentioned Jeremy Nicholson down at Imperial. The first five, ten papers that he published, he did a principal components analysis in every one of those papers. That's a multivariate statistical analysis. And then along come people like me and others and go, you know what? There's a lot of benefit to applying metabolomics. And I shift my research program, I start applying metabolomics. How shall I analyze the data? Well, what do you do? You go to the literature, right? And you look up and you, and you understand what other people do. And that's what happened. So in, in, in transcriptomics, the community started and the pioneers and the first few papers were applying one particular type of method and off the community went in that direction. And in metabolomics, it went off in the, in the other direction. To prove that I'm, I'm actually not a sheep, um, I was one of the papers we published in, I think, 2006 or seven. it was one of the first applications where we said, actually, univariate statistics is valuable, and we published a metabolomics paper with, using univariate st statistical analysis. I do honestly think it was one of the first papers published doing that. So... Let's just remind you about metabolomics data sets. So we have lots of variables, and these are the metabolites, and we have lots of samples. This happens to have 18 samples. And, okay, we've got some groups here. We've got, uh, there's three groups of data. There's some controlled data, where there's something called INDO, and there's something called MPA. Those are two different drugs. This was um, looking at the effects of drugs on, on cell lines. So different samples broken into three different groups. And then you've got metabolites, ADP, AMP, acetate, alanine, star gene, it's, it's in alphabetical order. And that's a long old list continuing way over to the right. Um, so many, many, many variables. So metabolomics data is multivariate. And so is it appropriate to use univariate statistics? And how do we use univariate statistics to analyze multivariate data? So. First question, is it appropriate to use univariate statistics? Yes, it is. You do miss relationships between variables, but if I've measured a 1,000 variables, I am actually allowed to take the first variable, conduct a statistical test on it, move to the second variable, conduct another statistical test. There's, there's nothing fundamentally wrong about doing that. And nowadays, univariate stats is used quite a lot in metabolomics. So yes, we can use univariate statistics. So we can use t-tests, we can use ANOVAs, but we've got to do it carefully. And this slide tells you about why we need to do it carefully. So for, you, for those that have done tests, statistical tests, you will know that you have to set a p-value, and that p-value is your threshold for you determining whether or not the test result is significant or not significant. And um, I was going to say tradition. I mean, working practice is perhaps a better way to say it, is that a p-value of less than 0 0.05 is considered to be an appropriate threshold for determining whether a statistical test is, um, uh, has a significant or a non-significant result. <coughs> 
Now, what a p-value of less than 0.050% actually um, means is there is a 5% error rate. This is because 0.055%. There's a 5% error rate in um, with such a p-value, which means if you say you're doing a study and you're going to measure um, 20 different responses, and in reality, you don't know this, nature knows this, in reality, none of these 20 so-called responses are actually, none of them should be significant results. So, I can't think of a quick example of that. So just say you're going to do 20 tests, and in reality, none of them should be factored as significant. If you now conduct 20 let's say, t-tests with a p-value of 0.05, one, in the, one, one out of 20 tests, one out of 20 of those tests that you've done will show up on average as a what's called a false positive. So it isn't in really significant, but the test, because of the, the error rate associated with the test, it will be, it'll be showing up as significant, and you will believe that it's significant. And you have no way of knowing if it really is significant or not. It's just shown up as significant in the test. That's if you did 20 tests. So if you imagine now you've, got, you've, got, you've measured 100 metabolites and you're going to do a statistical test on all of these, you're going to do 100 different univariate tests with that p-value. Now you're going to have five of these, 5% 5 of 105, five false positives. So bit worrying if your your results from your summer project where you do a whole bunch of measurements and you get five significant responses a bit worrying that they could all be completely false now up to the scale of a mass spectrometry study a thousand metabolites you apply a thousand univariate tests at that p-value you're going to get 50 false positives so again let me just bring bring this home Imagine you, you take blood samples. Yeah, let's do it right. Here's one. All the men, all the women. No, that's not the right example because there are differences. Pretend you're all the same biochemically. We, we take blood samples from all of you. We measure a 1,000 metabolites in all of you. And let's pretend that there are no differences between men and women biochemically. If you do that and you apply univariate stats, just as I'm describing here, the stats will tell us that 50 of those 1,000 metabolites are actually significantly different between men and women when they're not. So this is completely unacceptable error rates. We'd be drawing all sorts of conclusions about biochemical pathways which are completely wrong. So somehow, if we're going to use univariate statistics with such large data sets, we have to control this error rate much, much more than just using p-value of 0.05. So we have to use a much more strict p-value for the threshold um, for saying when a test is significant or not. And the easiest way to do this was a new piece of statistical theory, which was developed now, what, 20, 22 years ago, published in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society by a couple of um, statisticians called Benjamini and Hochberg, and they developed a theory called the false discovery rate, which is abbreviated to FDR. Now, you may have seen this did you see this new transcriptomics? Did they talk about FDR? Ah, oh, okay. Well, I'm kind of glad they haven't, because um, now you've learned about it from another one of the omics. So if you apply this, this quite simple false discovery rate correction, what it does is it says, all right, you're doing an experiment and you're measuring a 1,000 metabolites. Okay, well, what we'll do then what it automatically does for you is it adjusts the p-value such that you can greatly reduce the number of false positives in your in your experimental uh, in your statistical analysis. So if you want to have say uh, a five percent false discovery rate, it really does limit the number of false positives that you that you obtain in the data. So it means that when you apply those stats and you get results that say this is significant, you're, you're able to believe it much more confidently. So the summary on this is univariate statistics is applicable to metabolomics. It's now fairly widely used. 
but you've got to think carefully about how you apply it and the key technique is this FDR correction. And if, honestly, if I picked up a paper on transcriptomics, unless I was unlucky, if I pick up a typical transcriptomics paper, they'll do univariate statistics with a false discovery rate correction. So what you're learning about here is directly relevant to, the, to transcriptomics. Okay. So that was just to let you know you can do it, but you've got to do it carefully. And, and in, the, um, in the examples, in the, in the final lecture in a minute, you'll see some examples where we've applied that. But logic says metabolomics measures many variables. This is multivariate data. We should apply multivariate data set. Uh, we should apply multivariate statistical analysis. And so this is arguably um, a more relevant type of analysis. And I'm going to tell you to start with in this part about what are called unsupervised multivariate analysis and introduce you to this technique called PCA. So, multivariate, just to explain some terms, multivariate, I've already explained, dealing with large numbers of variables, it's, it's multivariate data. I need to explain this term unsupervised. So there is unsupervised and there is supervised, and I will tell you about supervised in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes time. So unsupervised means when you apply this multivariate analysis on your data, the analysis algorithm, the, the computer, the, the stats package, doesn't have any knowledge of the identities of the samples. So if we, if we, um, we go back to the taking blood from all of you, measure a 1,000 metabolites in all of you, men versus um, women in terms of is there a difference. If we were to give that, our, that, that set of data to this, um, this type of analysis, an unsupervised analysis, we would not provide any details of who were men and who were women. So it, we're giving the data, in a sense, the algorithm is blind to the information. So what the algorithm does, and, and you'll see this in the coming slides, is it looks for innate variation within the data set. So it's not saying, I've got male data, female data, I need to find differences. It's not saying that at all. What it's going to say is, I've got this whole big set of metabolomics data, and I'm going to see if any peaks change between all these samples. It doesn't know what men are, it doesn't know what women are. It's in unsupervised. And there are many types of unsupervised method, many, many, many types. And I'm going to focus on one that most commonly used, which is called principal components analysis. And it's, it is very widely used in metabolomics, but also in, in other omics techniques as well. So drilling down a bit then into um, principal components analysis and how that works. If we measure a thousand variables in a sample, for example, metabolites in your blood, it is very common in large data sets, such as that large multivariate data sets, to have correlated variables. So correlated variables um, mean that there's redundancy in the, in the data because if variable one measures some property of you, and variable two, which is a different variable, a different metabolite, measures this second metabolite, but those two metabolites are very closely related, and the levels of one tend to be similar to the levels of two, then you have redundancy in the information, because metabolite one can tell you something, but metabolite two can tell you the same thing, but they're not really telling you anything different. So you can get what's called redundancy, and this is going to become... This slide will actually be a lot clearer to you after I've, if you come back and look at it after I've gone through the next, um, a couple of examples of what PCA is actually doing to the data. PCA, principal components analysis, um, pet peeve of mine, I say this every year, but people just ignore me in any case. Look at the spelling of principal. Now, I don't know if, if 
So there's, the word principle has two spellings. There's this one. This principle is as in principle main, the main component, the primary <laughs> component, bless you. The other spelling of principle is P-R-I-N-C-I-P-L-E, and that means a principle as in a, you know, a rule. A, it's, there's, so there's two spellings of principle, and it's this one. It, we're looking for the main components in the analysis. There are even research papers. I was looking at a paper this morning on the train to work, and in the abstract, they'd spelt principal component analysis wrong. So PCA exploits the redundancy that exists when you have many, 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 many um, variables and, and correlated variables. It picks out patterns in the variables. Again, this will become clearer to you. And it reduces the dimensionality of the data set without throwing away tons of information. And that's, it will come clear to you again what I mean by that, but that's extremely important. Um, if we measure 5,000 peaks, I'll just tell you these numbers, and then you'll, you'll see it coming true on the next few slides. If we measure 5,000, on the next few slides, if we measure 5,000 peaks, we are actually portraying that information, that data, in 5,000 dimensional space which is a little bit hard for us to visualize. Um, even four dimensions is hard to visualize, but the reality of 5,000 measurements, 5,000 variables, you're working in 5,000 dimensional space. When we come to plotting that and showing results in a, in, a, in a journal, in a publication, typically we work in two dimensions and we show what are in effect X, Y plots. So we have to take a data set that is intrinsically of 5,000 dimensions and we're going to reduce it down to two dimensions. So we need some clever algorithms to help reduce the dimensionality of the data without throwing away lots of information. Again, this will become more clear to you. PCA is also called a projection or an ordination technique. And again, this will become clear as you think about the, um, what it's doing. So I'm going to go through... Two ways of thinking about PCA. The first way is, a, is um, hopefully really simple. The second way, it's a little bit, it's, I scale it up slightly. But I, I go through, in a sense, I go through quite similar material twice now. And I'm going to start it really, you know, in a way that gives you a clear example and you'll be able to follow it, I'm absolutely sure. So I'm going to explain the principles behind PCA, and I'm going to do it by um, an experiment that we're going to do here now, where we start by considering um, a group of fish. This is the, the, our experimental system. There are 50 fish. Yes, there's only four shown, but there's 46 that are hiding in there somewhere. So there's a total of 50, 50 fish. And for each and every fish, we're going to measure the length of the fish and the breadth of the fish. And kind of obvious from the top picture, there's some small ones and there's some big ones and there's a lot in the middle. So if we do that, we end up with 50 length measurements and 50 breadth measurements, okay, trivial. We can plot that, again, totally trivial, length versus breadth. There are 50 dots on this plot because it's 50 fish. You can immediately see, as is completely obvious that there should be, there is a relationship between length and breadth of the, um, the fish data. And so you would, you would look at this and go, well, yeah, of course, it's correlated. It's bound to be correlated. Our data at the moment, strictly speaking, is multivariate. Because we have fish number one to three, and fish 50. And for each fish, we have a length and a breadth. So this is a multivariate data set. If you want to be really particular, it's a bivariate data set because there's two variables. But at least there's more than one. It's, let's think of this as multivariate. And when you're dealing with two variables, yes, it's not very complicated. So why do we really need to, you know, there's not huge value in reducing two dimensions down to one, but that's the exercise that we're going to go through. Because then if you understand two down to one, it helps you to understand 5,000 down to two a little bit easier. So given that we have this data, which you can visualize like this, or you can put in a table like this, and it's multivariate, what can we do to try and decrease from two variables down to one variable. Well, what your minds have already done is you've realized that there's a correlation between these variables. 
So, uh, and this is the redundancy that I was talking about, because the length information describes the fish, the breadth information describes the fish, but actually, if we were to draw a line through these data points, do I have a pen anywhere? Yes. This bit always makes me nervous whenever I do this. I always feel like I'm drawing on the whiteboard to do this, but I'm um, feeling like I'm drawing on the screen. So, right? Am I going to draw on this? Yes. Okay, so we have a, we have a line through here at once. We've drawn a line through here, and this is called principal component one. And if we take, let's make it a few other data points so you can see it more easily. If we go from our data point down onto this line, and this is perpendicular, so I've dropped it down perpendicular. This line is, goes from zero up to, let's pretend it goes up to one. I mean, this is a continuous line. So about here, this is about, what, 0 0.3? So on PC1, this particular data point has a value of 0.3. This one is about 0.6. This one is about 0.5. This one's about 0.9, and so on. So instead of saying this data point has a length of 65 and um, a breadth of about 60, I'm now saying it has a PC1 score of about 0.3. Okay. One of these days I'm going to screw that up and draw on the screen. Um, so what we've done is we've created a new axis, PC1, that accounts for the largest variation. So we didn't draw that red line here. We drew it through the, the maximum variation, which is along this axis. You can drop every one of these data points in, in blue, every one of the fish has a PC1 value, which you can derive. So PC1 is just some linear combination of length and breadth. breadth. So this is what I was drawing. You project the two original variables into one new variable. PC1 is a linear combination, I just said that. And now your data set can look like this. Now, slight deviation from what I was doing. Obviously with PC1 values up to 12 or higher, you know, maybe this went to 20. The axis goes to 20, doesn't it? That's irrelevant how that, that particular number. So instead of having length and breadth data, you've replaced length and breadth by a simple PC1 value. Um, and you've reduced the data set from 2 to 1 dimensions. And that's what PCA is actually doing. So just to say that again, if you look at, just, just think about the black axes, you've got a bunch of data superimposed against two axes, it's bivariate. And now ignore the black axes, just look at the red axes, you have all this data represented along one axis and it now becomes a univariate score. So you've reduced from two to one dimensions. For those of you that really want to think about this carefully, and this arguably is a little, going a little bit beyond what, where I want to, but I will say it. If you don't get it, don't worry, just ignore it. What information are you losing by doing something like this as you drop each of these down onto the perpendicular and calculating their value? The information you're losing is the fact that this data point is not sitting here, it's sitting here. And so there is something a bit different about that one. It sits further away from the line than any other ones of these samples. And by collapsing it down here, I mean, originally it had a, it was rather stunted for its breadth. Because for that breadth, you would have expected a fish to be longer. So this, for some reason, is quite a short fish. And that's the information that, you, that you're throwing away. Also here, and this one's a little bit, any, actually any fish above the line is a little bit shorter than we would have predicted. And any fish below the line, this one is actually a longer fish than you would have predicted for its, its breadth. You would have expected it to be here, not like here. And so it's, 
you can't go from two variables and two dimensions down to one without throwing something, throwing away some information. And the information you're throwing away is the fact that all these samples are not lying dead on that line, they're lying with the box. But one of the things you have to deal with in omics is you have so much data, you can't... You can't hold on to purist principles. You have to let some stuff go. And it's that sort of thing, that dimensionality reduction is a good example of that. OK, so that's a simple graphical example. Fish, length, breadth, two dimensions coming down to one. I'm going to go through exactly the same concept, but I'm going to scale up to three dimensions. Um, so I'll, I'll do it from with the mouse rather than walking over the board. Here's a data matrix. You have to imagine that there's numbers in this matrix. Each of these rows is a separate sample. We'll focus on sample number four. And we have a metabolite one, or variable one, metabolite two, variable two, metabolite three, or variable three. So this is actually trivariate data. It's three variables in this. We can plot this, variable one, variable two, variable three axis. We can plot where this, this particular sample lies, and let's pretend it lies right here. So that's, that's simply plotting data in three, three dimensions. That's, that's easy. If you add all the data points from the whole matrix, you get this sort of cloud. I'm going to redraw this on the left side of the next slide. So I've literally just redrawn what was on the previous slide here. Now, this cloud of points in three dimensions the first thing I want to do, or the first thing the algorithm is going to do, um, is it doesn't like having the cloud away from zero, and so it does something called mean centering, and it gets hold of the cloud, and it shifts the whole cloud such that the average of the cloud sits on zero, zero, zero. It's just a technicality. Um, you can think of that as the axis moving to the cloud, or the cloud moving to the axis. It doesn't matter. There's just a shift in the data points. Here's the little sample that we're following. Remember what we did with the um, length and breadth in the fish data? We had a swarm of data points, and we apply, okay, redrawing it on the left side again, that's identical to on the right, the other one. We apply principal component number one. Principal component number one is drawn through the largest scatter of the points to explain as much variation as possible, and it says this here, um, this is PC1, yeah, that's just saying uh, in writing what I've been speaking. And then for each of the data points, we project down, just as I was drawing on the whiteboard a second ago. So the data point that we've been following, which is the, the magenta one, this has a PC1 score of here on this axis. And then... For the fish example, we only have length and breadth, and so you can only show PC1. Now that we've got three variables, I, I can go and I can introduce a second axis. And so a second axis is drawn for PCA. It has to be perpendicular to the first axis, which again, it, it says, says this here on the slides, which of course you, you can get access to now as well. And that data point that we've been following, we can project that down, and it has a PC2 value. So there's not really any difference between that and the fish example, except this is done in three dimensions as opposed to the fish was in two. If you now just squint and think, ignore the color, just look at black. You've got variable one, variable two, variable three, and a bunch of data points. So you've got a bunch of data points shown in a three-dimensional um, plot. Now, ignore all the black axes, variable one, variable two, variable three. Just focus on the blue and the red ones. You've got two new variables. They're perpendicular. One's called principal component one. One's called principal component two. And each and every sample in your study has been projected onto these PC1 and PC2 values. Keep an eye out on PC1, PC2, two orthogonal axes. That is 
It's not the same data, this is different data, but this is what a PCA scores plot of metabolomics data looks like. So this is the sort of thing that you could, that you almost always see or very frequently see in any metabolomics paper. Principal components analysis scores plot because it's looking at the scores data. So if I go back up for a second just to be clear on terminology, when you project these values down, the new value is called a, a score. So imagine you've done a metabolomic study and you've got something like, I don't know, 40 samples in your study. Imagine you've measured 1,000 metabolites. 5,000 doesn't matter. Thousands of metabolites. If you take that data and you then put it into a principal components analysis, it's going to take... 5,000 dimensional space, and it's capable of reducing it all down to just two simple dimensions. Now, what's really clever here, and it's now transitioning to explain how you interpret these, the relative distances amongst individual samples in this plot represent the similarities and differences between those samples. So, saying that really simply, see those three red dots that are almost sat on top of each other? If th these... If these are LCMS, liquid chromatography mass spec metabolomics data, as it says in the title, that sample, that one and that one, metabolically are almost identical. So if they group closely together, their metabolomic signature or their metabolic signature is, is almost identical. The ones that are a long way away, so say from the red ones down here to the blue ones up here, these are metabolically very different. So as a reminder, think about, I showed you 12 spectra, and I said 10 are very similar, and two are, two are quite different. PCA is going in, it's finding which ones are similar, which ones are different. It's grouping the ones that are very similar, and putting the ones that are different a long way away in different clusters. And if I just click the mouse a few times here, this is actually rat urine data from female rats taken in the night, female rats taken in the day, male rats taken at night, male rats taken in the day. And the fact that you're seeing these distinct clusters is showing that there are diurnal differences so within male, day and night, female, day and night. That's the primary difference in the data set. And then males and females have different urine, and that's the second difference. What's important, as I said earlier on, this is unsupervised analysis. So when all this data was given to the PCA, to, to, the, to the algorithm, to the principal components analysis algorithm, the algorithm didn't know which ones were May day or female day, female night and male night. It didn't know the identities. It just gets given a whole bunch of samples. And it looks for similarities and differences between them, plots it, and then you, as the experimentalist, you know what samples you gave it, and you put the labels on. I'm going to give you, I think there's two more examples coming up. of PC So these are all PCA scores plots. This is the classic way of showing the data. This is, again, urine from different, different species of mammal in this case. And so we've already put the labels on, but you, as the practitioner or me the practitioner put the labels on. The algorithm was given, oh I don't know, was it 10, 20, 30, 40? There's at least a hundred samples worth um, at least a hundred samples there with a with a full metabolite measurement for all these different urine samples. And then it's it's gone looking through the similarities and differences and it's figured out that all these samples grouped together now we label them, ah, they're all rat, rabbit, they're all rabbit, and so mouse groups together. And actually, if you think about this, this, this makes a lot of sense, because if this, I can't remember which lab this came from, um, but mouse, rabbit, and rat, this is going to be lab animals, it's not, somebody didn't run around outside trapping rabbits for this experiment, so these are lab animals, so probably they are genetically quite similar and they're probably kept in very controlled environments and fed a very 
controlled diet for all these three species on the right. Humans don't like that sort of uh, treatment. So this was probably wild-type sampling of humans, meaning it was a room full of people like themselves, where if this is urine, what you ate last night, what you drank last night, all those signatures, caffeine, alcohol, um, taurine from oh, um, TMAO from fish, all sorts of signatures in your metabolism show up in the urine sample the next day. And this vast variability of the human urine metabolome makes a lot of sense compared to these tight clusterings of these lab animals. So you can tell an awful lot from, from data like this. So if, what did I say? This might be about 100 samples. So if it's 100 samples, this is NMR, so 2,000 bins, 100... So there's probably 200,000 data points that have been collected here. And 200,000 data points has been reduced down to a simple XY plot. And there's so much you can derive from that, including why these two human samples up here, these humans seem quite rat-like in their urine, which is who knows the origin of that. So here's another example, again, PCA scores plot. Again, PC1 plotted against PC2. This was from a study, um, this is some actually work I did years ago. It doesn't really matter that it was salmon eggs, and it doesn't really matter that it was looking at the effect of a pesticide. It was a biological system that was stressed by something. Here are the controls. You'd hope controls would all be metabolically consistent or similar. If they're similar, they should group together, and they do. They all group in the bottom left. This is one part per billion of this stress, this pesticide. This is 10 and 100 over here. So if you add a little bit of stress to the system, metabolically, it affected the animals. I'll be careful with the word significantly because I'm not doing a test here as such. But there is a large metabolic change when we expose them to some level of stress. And when you stress them even more, that change continues. So again, it's a very simple way of representing here, um, again, you know, a few tens of samples, 2,000 variables per sample, so 20, probably about 100,000 data points here, just represented in a simple two-dimensional plot. Okay, so summary of PCA, it's a common, unsupervised method. The aim is to identify similarities and differences between the samples. So you've just seen that in the, in the examples I'm showing you. Control versus stressed, uh, male versus female. So it's pulling out these differences. It's an excellent initial approach. It's very, very good at getting a feel for what your data looks like. What's good at identifying outliers and so on. And it can be used to determine which metabolites are different between the groups, but it's not great at that. Um, so, again, control versus stressed, metabolically what actually changed. Yes, you can get some information from the PCA analysis, but there are better techniques for doing that. Okay, that's... That's PCA, that's unsupervised analysis. I'm going to keep going so that we can get through this particular lecture because on the next bit, which is the unsupervised, sorry, the next part is the, the supervised, um, it's just, there's just a few slides because it's actually somewhat similar to this. Um, so supervised multivariate statistical analysis, it's, it's quite similar to PCA, but it, it's, um, there's at least one part that's fundamentally different. And the technique I'm going to tell you about is something called partial least squares analysis, which is abbreviated to PLS. Uh, and again, just as I go into this type of supervised multivariate analysis, I want to just clarify the terms. And hopefully, if you're following me, you would have already have guessed what supervised means. It means that the algorithm now does have knowledge of the identities of the samples. So when I said to you earlier, imagine we give it um, metabolic metabolomics data on blood samples from all of you, males versus females. In the case of a supervised analysis, we would say to the algorithm, these are the female ones, 
These are the male ones. Now go find the difference. So it's very good at finding so-called, let's say, biomarkers that discriminate different groups. Um, it's very good at building what are effectively mathematical models for predicting class assignment. So easy explanation of this. Take the males in the room, take the females in the room, blood samples from both of you, take all that data, feed it into this sort of analysis, it builds a model that says male blood metabolism tends to look like this, female blood metabolism tends to look like that. Somebody passes in the corridor, I've got my back to the corridor, or you quickly race out, take a blood sample from them, come in and say to me, here's a blood sample, is this from a male or a female? I can take that blood sample, do an NMR or mass spec analysis, put it into the mathematical model that we've built based upon you, and it will spit out the result and saying that looks like a female or it looks like a male. So predicting class assignment, and I've got a very silly example of that. Um, on one of the slides in a second. So again, I've already said, already said those points. And here's the silly example. I don't know how I got sucked into doing this, but across in Leicestershire, there is um, the Cent Waltham Centre for Pet Nutrition. Waltham is a, um, one of the, it's in the Mars Corporation of companies. Waltham makes dog food amongst various other things. And the scientists there said, well, we've heard about metabolomics. We want to know if it can do anything of value to our research in, in pet nutrition. Um, can we conceive of a study with you? This is what I'd like to try. And so they paid us to do this. They decided, because they actually keep both miniature schnauzers on site over in this, this, this nutrition center and Labradors, they decided to do a study where, first of all, they gave us a bunch of urine samples from, from Labradors and, and urine samples from miniature schnauzers, which were abbreviated to MS, and I think Labrador is L something. And they said, first of all, here they all are. You know what they are. We'll tell you what they are. Um, we used NMR spectroscopy. We then collected all that data, and we used this supervised method of analysis called partial squares discriminant analysis. And so we told the algorithm, several of these, the, the black squares, these belong to labs, and the black circles belong to the miniature schnauzers. Can you find metabolic differences between these two breeds of, of dog? And yeah, there are. I mean, surprisingly big metabolic differences between, between them. And so we reported back to them and said, yeah, there's big metabolic differences. Um, easy to, to see the difference. And I said, really? Is it that easy? So we'll give you seven more samples, seven more urine samples from, from dogs in, from their, their site, their, their research center. But we won't tell you what those samples are. And so we, we did that. We, we obtained these seven additional samples, measured the NMR profiles, put them into the model that already existed that was built around miniature schnauzers and Labradors, and made a prediction on each of those seven urine samples and said, yep, that looks like miniature schnauzer, that looks like Labrador. And, and got, it was all blinded to us, but we got seven out of seven correct. Um, so PLS discriminant analysis, the scores plot is interpreted the same as a PCA scores plot that we've just been learning about. The axes are called something different, they're called latent variables, but this is just detail. The way you interpret a PLS scores plot is similar. So you know, when these samples were grouping close together with the Labrador, this is very similar, and the miniature schnauzers are very different. This is a different type of, an, uh, of um, graphical output that you can get, where it's, it's a prediction of the Y variable. It's a prediction of the class being lab Labrador where values towards the top are known lab uh, are Labrador and values towards the bottom are not Labrador, which in our case was miniature schnauzer. And so these are all the animals that we knew were Labrador. These are all the animals we knew were miniature schnauzers. And those seven symbols, open symbols, were the ones that we didn't know. Four were predicted to lie up here. So this is clearly a Labrador classification. And this down the bottom is... Um, is miniature schnauzer. Now, you might think that's a totally stupid example. And honestly, I agree with you. That's a completely stupid example. But this sort of 
building classification models to discriminate two different types of sample, this is really, really powerful. So uh, food production plant, chickens in a food production plant, um, you can imagine taking chickens that are um, healthy and others that perhaps have a particular disease and you build a classification model to find those small numbers of metabolites that differentiate those two classes, then you then have a predictive model, and then you use it in your processing plant. Every thousand sample or hundred sample, you, you, know, you can be screening for a disease and looking, um, identifying the phenotype of the samples that you don't know about based upon the prior building of a model that you, uh, that you do know about. I think I've got one more slide on. Okay, I've said that. I think I've got a couple more slides here. Then. Or is that, no, I think that's coming up later. So in terms of, in case any of you uh, dog lovers, in terms of which metabolites actually differentiated the breeds, we had almost no idea. Um, so that the, the leading ones, of the leading metabolites, of the 10 top metabolites, only two of them, we knew what they were. And so there were eight unidentified metabolites. And the reason I put that in, actually, is to make clear back to you about what I said this morning, that identifying metabolites is a real challenge still. I mean, this is just a metabolites in the urine of a dog, and we can't even... I mean, it's a mammal crying out loud. And it's urine. It's not like some f weird... Um, sample type, but, and yet 80% of the metabolites we could not identify. And we got p-values in here, you see, so we did some univariate statistical testing, um, and that would be with false discovery rate correction. So again, different ways of analyzing the data. Okay, so the, the slide I was thinking of is in the examples, which is um, I'll do in the, in the final lecture. So two final slides on data standards and databases. When you were learning about the transcriptomics, did they say anything about why well, there are those terms familiar? Miami or Mage? No? No, okay. Um, it's very easy to conduct a metabolomics experiment extremely poorly. It is very hard to conduct one extremely well. There are just so many things that can go wrong that one needs to be very, very careful in how these are conducted, and then very, very thorough in how you report what you did. And so data standards in biology in general have become a really, really important topic in the last 10 years. Um, data standards in omics, well, that's what... There's a little bit of background here for the other omics that you learn about. And data standards in metabolomics, which is just this, this bottom box... So in 2007, the International Metabolomic Standards Initiative was launched and it got scientists together all over the globe to say, if you're going to do a metabolomic study in your lab, this is what you should be reporting. If you're going to use chemostats, you should describe this. If you're going to sample the chemostats in a particular way, you need to describe that. You need to describe how you're going to prepare the samples. You need to describe how you generate the data, how you process the data, what statistical analysis that you do. And so the very the top journals in the, you know, things like Science and Nature and, and others that are um, the top ones in this field of metabolomics, they rely on such initiatives as this to say, oh, look, I've submitted a paper to Nature if it doesn't meet the standards defined by the global, the international community, this paper will just get thrown out because it hasn't been done to a particular standard. So um, probably only having one slide on data standards, honestly, in a course like this, is probably not enough. I think data standards should be talked about a lot, lot more with you. But within metabolomics, there's this thing called the uh, MSI. And... Again, doing injustice to it, really, but, but databases. Um, I, and I don't know if Array Express was mentioned, or when you're learning about proteomics, whether these other databases were mentioned. But in metabolomics, um, the main database 
public database for metabolomics data um, is something called Metabolites, and it's at the European Bioinformatics Institute. So what I mean by a database is if I'm trying to publish in a very high-quality journal, I have to make my data freely available. In fact, if I'm funded by the research councils, so BBSOC, NERC, MRC, that work, that's taxpayers' money, that work needs to be open access. And so if I'm submitting to a particular journal, the top ones, I have to put my data into public databases. And for metabolomics, the most significant one, other than one in the US, the, the most significant in the, in the world, actually, is metabolites. So I wanted to just put the word MSI, the Standards Initiative, and I wanted to put metabolites, those two terms in front of you, um, before we finish talking about bioinformatics. And again, um, some, some good papers. I, I would mention the names and say something about it, but I'm, I'm, I'm over on time, so you can always look those up if you're interested, and it's pretty clear what we've gone through. So let's stop. Um, maybe if we get back by 10 past, so maybe in seven minutes. The last, in the examples, I've got four examples, and quite often I only cover three, so it doesn't matter if I, if I drop off an example. Um, I'll try and get through all four. But, so let's, let's, let's meet again at 10 past, and then I will definitely finish by 10 to 4 at the latest. Okay, the final, the fourth and final series of slides. As I said um, in your lecture one, these are picked from different areas where I've just tried to highlight some of the, uh, the diversity of methods that are used, some of the, the different statistical approaches that are used, and just give you some examples of the applications. So if you're thinking in this first study, okay, it's human medicine, well, you know, why show that in this class? Well, it's a, it's a clear example of um, application to trying to discriminate a couple of different groups. So it doesn't matter if it happened to be human plasma, as you'll see. It's the fact that it's an approach that was um, applied where one didn't know what the metabolic differences were between two groups. They went in, they studied it, they found differences, and then they have a classification model. Much like the dog urine example, um, but just in um, a few more slides explaining it. I'll, I will fly quickly through some of the, um, the rationale behind some of the studies because it's, um, if, the, if the rationale is human disease, I won't dwell on it for this lecture. So I'm going to do one on um, disease classification between two, two different groups. The, the next example, the, while it's interesting in, um, in terms of the, the, the data itself, it's actually time course data. So if you're interested in, say, you, you know, you, you're engineering a, a genetic change in a, in a species or organism, um, the concept of collecting data through time and, and how we can get these metabolic, what we call metabolic trajectories. So just think of, again, generalize what you're seeing beyond just this is a study in fish, which the second one happens to be. It's actually a, it's a nice example of a time course study and then the addition of a stress and what happens to the time course uh, when the stress is added. The third, formerly its application is in, in tox toxicology, but this is quite a nice example where if when we look into the metabolites that are changing in a little bit more detail and we relate it to um, some existing knowledge, it tells us more about the mechanism, the biochemical mechanism of the perturbation. So, yes, it happens to be toxicity, but it could be in the context of, a, of a, um, um, something more directly related to your own work. And the fourth study, which, I, as I said, I might, quite often I don't get to the fourth one, but may, we'll see. It's um, more similar to the, to the first one, but there's some subtle differences in that one as well. Okay, so part one, did I, I did start, I am recording. Yes, we are recording. So, the first one, diagnosis of coronary heart disease. 
So, quick overview of CHD, coronary heart disease. This is where, again, you, if you've had basic biology, you'll know this, or physiology. You've got coronary arteries are the arteries supplying blood to the heart itself. And if those arteries begin to become blocked, if you get fatty material and, and building up inside of those arteries, you're reducing the blood supply to the heart, and that's what can lead to a, a heart attack. Um, more mild symptoms before the full-on heart attack, and you know, which of course can be fatal, is things like chest pain. Um, so there is okay. So there's this condition. At the moment, the way in which you diagnose this condition. So say I went into the doctor's office and I said, "Oh, I've got bad chest pains." Um, if that doctor, if he or she thought uh, it could be coronary heart disease, they would send me off to, to a hospital to have something a procedure conducted called coronary angiography. And let me just go to the next slide quickly, just to so you can see the severity of this procedure. Um, if it was me, well, whoever the patient is, the patient's not out on the table. It's, it's a very invasive procedure, a diagnostic procedure to have this done. And what that, that um, medical team here is doing, if I go back one slide, is ultimately what they want to do is they want to image the heart. And the way that this imaging is done is they've got to get some, some dye into the heart and they take a catheter, which is a tube, and thread it inside of you, up your veins, and um, actually thread... Um, thread this tubal catheter into another blood vessel, either in your arm or down in your groin, and um, get the tube up to your heart, inject this dye, and that's what makes the, the arteries visible. So if I go back to the, to the screen I was showing you, this is why this, this, this image up here is um, this imaging apparatus is taking an image of the heart as they're injecting this dye near the heart so that they can work out if some of the blood vessels are, are blocked or not. So it's very, very invasive. And the question is, is if you look at what's in the left, which is what I was just talking about, versus the concept of can you replace all of this with a simple, I hope you don't mind needles, with a simple blood test. I'll quickly go on to the next slide in case somebody doesn't like needles. Can you replace all that with a simple blood test? Well, when I say simple, taking blood and then going on and using metabolomics. And this is an interesting study. It's, I mean, it's the, the paper I showed you at the end of lecture one, so it's Jeremy Nicholson, Imperial working with St. Peter's Cambridge, and it was published in a very high-profile journal, Nature Medicine, back in 2002. I was phoned by Nature when I was in California at the time, asking to review and comment upon this paper, and on face value it looked extremely significant, because the field of metabolomics was only about two or three years old, and to have a study like that was, was really, really significant. There is a slight downside to this story, which I'll tell you in a couple of slides' time. So a group at Imperial and Cambridge said, can we actually replace this, this very invasive um, diagnostic test using metabolomics? So can we take a blood test, a blood sample, go off to an NMR system, um, and for a bunch of patients which are ultimately healthy and a bunch of patients that have heart disease, measure all these NMR spectra, so here's your chemical shift axis. This is a blood sample of, sorry, this is an NMR section of blood directly, and um, there's, there's a lot of light, uh, it's detailed, but the reason it doesn't quite look like what you were looking at before is there's a lot of lipoproteins in these particular samples, and you get a lot of underlying effects here. This isn't just lots of peaks superimposed. This is at the basis of this rather ugly-looking spectrum is for other reasons, but I won't go into it all now. You can see from the identification of some of the peaks, they're looking at lipids, and I'll read this out if you can't see it, but glucose and some amino acids, choline, lots and lots of different lipid signals all in this region here. So what they did was, and I'll go to the results slide because it's got information on the, on the design. They took 30 patients which ended up being normal. So when I say ended up being normal, they came into the, into the GP's office, they had the pain in, 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 the, in the chest, they went and they had the, that invasive technique done, the coronary angiography. And it was from that invasive technique, that's the gold standard technique, that they determined that these particular patients did not have heart disease. 
But what the team at Cambridge and Imperial had done it was collect blood samples from, um, from those patients already. And then there were 36 patients that did have blockage of arteries, and, and so therefore they did have real heart disease. And you can see on this plot that there is this separation. What you already know about how you interpret this, this is a scores plot again. You know that similar samples group together, and if you see things splitting, that means that there are metabolic differences here. And the, 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 the key message of this, this paper was, um, I've lost my pointer again. The, the, the key message of this, this paper was through the NMR metabolomics of the blood, we're able to see differences between the diseased and the healthy patients. And that procedure was certainly relatively non-invasive compared to um, the person having the, the angiography. And at the time when the paper was written, they said, you know, this was done on, what, 60, 66 patients, this isn't big enough, and we really need to scale this up. And so there's great excitement in the community around 2002, 2003, and they got funding for a much larger study, 1,650 people. And as that study was, was, was underway and more and more data came in, the message got less and less clear. So rather than having more samples and seeing an even clearer discrimination between the groups, in the end it's sort of, well, there may be a bit of a difference here in the metabolism of, of these two groups but it's not actually clear enough to be used in a diagnostic test. So the slightly negative ending on this first story is um, what looked good initially turned out to be not so good. I'm not saying there wasn't m metabolic differences, it's just those differences were not um, robust enough to be used as a replacement for the, for the uh, angiography. But they did... Uh, as as part of finding out which peaks were uh, different between the controls and the, and, the, and the disease group, they did identify some, effectively some biomarkers, and those were all related to fatty acid side chains in lipids, particularly low-density lipoproteins, very low-density lipoproteins. And this made quite a lot of sense, because if you think about when I introduced what, the heart, what this type of heart disease is, it's the buildup of this fatty material. So um, to have these, these, these sorts of metabolic changes as the, the markers of the disease actually makes some sense. So scientifically makes some sense, but practically when it scaled up, it didn't look so good as it did on that smaller scale study. Um, and ultimately it hasn't transformed clinical practice. It, there is, it is, in this particular case, it, um, there is no simple metabolic assay that now replaces the, the imaging technique. But you can see the concept of um, bringing in a new technique alongside an O1, taking the samples, applying the different uh, NMR data collection, which you've learned about, um, applying multivariate analyses, which you've learned about, and finding, finding those differences. Okay, so these are quite swift examples. On to the second one. This is the one where, okay, yes, it's embryogenesis in a fish, but you can think of it as a time series. It's quite a nice example of a time series experiment. Um, the, this particular fish species in, in this study is something called the Japanese madaka. It's used in Asia a lot. It's, um, it's much more popular in Asia than the zebrafish or zebrafish, which is a very widely used model organism for vertebrate development in Europe and the US. So it's sort of a parallel organism to the zebrafish. So then th this particular study had two aims. The first one was to um, characterize metabolic development over a period of eight days. And eight days, because that's the time it takes for this particular species to develop. Or this fish to develop. So on day one, um, they literally had fish eggs with some fat droplets in and a series of, et of, uh, so a series of cells. And then on day two, you begin to see the embryo developing, and day three, day four, and so on. That big black spot here, if I go to day eight, that's the eyeball of the fish, and the fish is wrapped around the, um, within, the, within this egg. And on day eight, at some point on day eight, this fish hatches. So 
the first part of this study was to say, well, how does the metabolic profile vary as we go through these different steps? And logically, it should vary a lot because on one end down here, we've got lots of energy storage molecules and we've got cells, but we don't have any sort of functioning organism. There's no cardiovascular system. There's no, there's no eye. There's no functioning organs. And at the other end, we have, in effect, we're, we're minutes or maybe hours away from a, a fish swimming around. So, you know, it's quite a big difference in terms of <laughs> the biology. Very, very big difference. Um, jumping in, this was an NMR study again. You've, you actually saw this slide earlier. Um, earlier this morning, so that there's a, the NMR data. And going, did I skip one? No, I didn't. So this is going right to the PCA results. So we've collected data on every single day of development, several replicas on every single day of development, and all that data and processed it all using techniques I haven't talked to you about, and analyzed it using the principal components analysis, which I have told you about, and this is again the principal components analysis scores plot, PC1 against PC2. So remember that samples that are close together are very similar metabolically, those that are far apart are quite different. And so if you look at the day one samples, you see there were four biological replicates, they're all quite closely grouped. By the time you get to day two, there's clearly a metabolic difference day two group very, very tightly, and so on. And you can, you know, you don't need me to read through the days. But what's clear is that, is that the metabolism over time is changing. Uh, it's actually changing quite a linear way, and something quite significant happens around day four or five, and then it changes in a, in a, a different way, but again, quite linear. So, as a reminder, there's, what, 30, 40 samples here times NMR data 2,000. So there's 60,000 data points, measurements gone into this. This is a multivariate data set, and we are applying this PCA approach, and you get this very simple visualization of, of how the, the uh, metabolism changes over time. If you want to use this as a predictive model, you could. So if you handed... Um, if we were handed a set of eggs from the species and we didn't know what age they were, we could extract the metabolites, collect the data, put it into this model, and this model would predict accurate to one day or maybe even half a day. It would predict the age of those eggs based upon the metabolic profile. I'm not saying that in itself is useful, but again, the sorts of things that you can do with, with metabolic data. So this time course and this following the process of the development of the embryo um, is quite an unusual example of metabolomics. The second part of this uh, little um, case study is then to expose the animals to a stress. Now, this happens to be toxicology. That's irrelevant. They were exposed to a stress as they underwent embryogenesis. And then on the seventh day of development, they were studied. So... What we've just been looking at was normal development. Now we come in with a stress, and we study the effect of that stress after seven cumulative days of, of stress. And again, I've gone straight to the result here. So this stress experiment had three groups in it. It had actually unstressed. In other words, it had some, some controls to measure in blue. It had... Um, low stress, which is in pink, and then it had high stress in red. Again, it's 46 parts per million of trichloroethylene. I mean, it doesn't matter what the details are. Control, low stress, high stress. So this is a completely independent experiment that's been overlaid on top of the first embryogenesis study. Where should day seven controls lie? Well, they should lie within, this, within the first day seven, and they do. They actually, they seem to cluster it even more tightly than the first experiment, but they're exactly where you would have predicted. So this is highly reassuring that the consistency between the two experiments is absolutely consistent, and there's the, there's the day seven control sitting where, where you expect it. What does a small amount of stress do? I mean, there were so many options. Does it accelerate development? That's 
could be kind of un unexpected. Does it retard development and make a day seven look like a day six? Might have done. Maybe a low level of stress has no effect at all. It's possible. Or maybe the low level of stress induces some other metabolic change. And it's the last one. Animals that were seven days old but, but that were stressed end up being here. So it sort of slowed them because it's moved it kind of back towards day six, but it's definitely not sitting on top of day six, it's sitting here. So you could argue from this 2D plot of, again, of a very large data set that, yes, the stress has had an effect, yes, the stress appears to have retarded development slightly, but the stress has also changed their metabolism away from even day six. Okay, now come in with a high stress. Well, to tell you the truth, what you could have hoped for was exactly to be here, because if controlled, low stress, you might think, you know, linear, um, linear effect. If you add more stress, then you're going to shift to them even more so, and you do. Now they don't look like, you know, they're certainly not day sixes, they're sort of like day fives on the x-axis, so really limited, um, really limiting the development. But clearly they have a metabolism that's, that's quite different from um, even, even the low dose. So really nice PCA showing the way in which is able to summarize all that really complicated metabolomics data down to just a simple plot. But that's not telling you anything about which metabolic pathways are being perturbed. For that, and this is a screenshot from the paper, very hard probably for you to read at a distance. I'll just pick out a couple of things. This is a table of, of digging into the detail of, okay, well, we see this change, but what are the metabolites? What are the pathways? What, what's actually going on in this um, uh, study? So we have a, this column is metabolites. This is the position in the NMR spectrum. This is the fold change, and this is the significance of that particular change. So uh, what, what do we want to pick? Um, energy-related molecules, um, pick an obvious one, ATP. It is decreasing almost twofold. It's a highly significant result. So the stress has come along. One of the things that the stress has done has really compromised the, the organism's energy metabolism, which is perhaps the most obvious one for me to pick. Okay, so that was where you can look at some time course data and then superimpose the stress on top of that. So first of all, that showed you characterization of the um, changes in the embryogenesis process. Um, you know, you could imagine doing something similar on cell cycle, or you could imagine doing time course on um, knocking out particular genes and looking at the evolution of that knockout as it spreads through um, time through a metabolic network. We've induced, um, we've induced some some toxicant-induced uh, trichloroethylene effects and identified some of those metabolic pathways that affected. And, I mean, this sort of study has implications for chemical safety, but that I'm not going to teach you about that today. Okay, third example. Now we're going to mass spectrometry, so now we're using a technique that's much more sensitive. We're using a technique that's going to discover many more metabolites, as you learned about this morning. This is actually using that, was it? Yeah, I think it was. That was using this, um, the, the FTICR mass spectrometer that I told you about this morning. Now, this is way too wordy, and I'm not going to go through it, because I, I want to do two things here. I want to say this particular um, miniature case study is on this little organism that you may or may not be familiar with. It's a water flea. My well, Latin name is Daphne Magna. It is actually used throughout the world in toxicity testing. Uh, so um, that's why lots of groups in academic labs as well study this because of its widespread use uh, in tox testing. It's also very heavily studied in ecology. And in this particular example, it's again a toxicology ex experiment. And without going through all the words, um, we can ask the question, if this animal is a representative animal of the aquatic environment, is stressed by a particular chemical, what's the mechanism by which that stress occurs? Can we learn anything about the biochemistry of the stress response? 
And again, you can see how that generalizes to any biological process that you might be interested in. Can we learn about the underlying metabolic biochemistry? So let me just pull up everything that you've learned about. There's some test organism, in this case, Daphnia. Some exposure studies are done. It's extracted, as I mentioned earlier. Data is collected, as I mentioned earlier. A lot of data pre-processing, which I told you exists, but I didn't tell you anything about it. And then applying statistical analyses. And I've got a nice comparison of PCA and PLSDA in this, in this study that is worth showing you. The experimental design, um, so, so this study was actually looking at simply a heavy metal. How much stress does a heavy metal induce? Very simple design, unexposed animals, and then increasing concentrations of copper. Okay, I won't bother reading all the other words. It's saying what's in the previous slide. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put both of these images up side by side. So the study was done. The animals were exposed to different levels of copper. Um, the animals were preserved, the metabolites were extracted, the mass spectrum, spectrometry was conducted, and eventually the statistical analysis was done. On the left, this is the unsupervised, the principal components analysis. This is where the algorithm doesn't know that they were controlled, this was low-dose copper and so on. It just was given all the spectra. On the right... This is the supervised approach. This is the partial least squares discriminant analysis. So in that case, I'm actually being clear here, and I've labeled it at the bottom. And it was ended up presented in, presented in this way because of some of the, looking at some of the results from, from here. This PLSDA was conducted with the black symbol so that the control and the low doses that didn't appear to have any effect formed one class, and then the, the two high doses um, were grouped together into a second group. So, okay, first of all, look at the PCA, unsupervised. You can see there's a bit of a separation. It's not that clear. There's an odd sample here. Sample number 24 is behaving unusually. But you can see that the controls and the lower doses are a little bit separated from here. So just looking at the intrinsic variation in the data, the PCA is able to just begin to pull this apart. But when you come along with a supervised method where you're saying to the algorithm, look, I want to know specifically the differences between this group and this group, it's a lot more powerful at being able to go into the data and find those differences and pull those groups apart, which is what it, what's happened here. So this looks like a much better result, I hope you would agree, because there's more separation than the PCA. And the reason for putting this case study in is to show you that that's, that's what these more powerful types of super supervised analysis are capable of doing. Yeah, I just say I don't know why sample 24 is an outlier, but it's, it clearly still is. No. Mm. Good. We'll sign you up for reviewing metabolomics papers. Yes, well done. So, these approaches on the left, the unsupervised approaches, um, these are not dangerous in the hands of people... You can't go wrong with PCA, it's safe. You're not putting labels on groups, you just can't go wrong. You could do the same, if you had a data set, you, you would do the same PCA as me, it's impossible to overinterpret it. That's a very, very good point that's just been made. When you start forcing separation between groups, which is what this is doing, because you've told it, there are going to be differences here, go find it. Just do anything you can to find differences. You can, you can obtain or, or undergo what's called overfitting of the data. And overfitting is finding differences that actually aren't there. So again, it's a bit like false positives and p-values I was telling you about earlier. The devil's always in the detail. So this could be overfit. Um, it could be finding changes that are not there. I would, given that the, the, what's available on the screen at the moment... I would categorically state that's not true in this case because 
the unsupervised, where you cannot overfit, there, there is a, a difference between the groups, it's just not that clear. Um, so there really are differences within this data set. But if you take, and I probably shouldn't tell you this because it, well, it's not going to worry you unless you start doing metabolomics as a, as a project, but if you were to take completely random data, um, there are situations in which, with two groups, control and treated, but completely made up numbers, you can force stuff like this to happen. So you can make your data look good when, in fact, it isn't. So the detail that, of course, I don't tell you about in a, in a lecture like this is there are a whole bunch of um, parameters and metrics that we use to assess quality. So one of them is called VIPs, the, the variable importance of the projection. It's the parameter that says, if I am being told that ATP is important and separating this from this, there is a, a VIP score for ATP. And depending on what that value is, it tells me whether or not this is, in a sense, overfit. You know, how reliable is that? So, so there's something called VIP. By all means, make notes, listen, and whatever, but I would never ask or expect any of you to know anything that I'm not, you know, when I go off motivated by your good questions to, to a higher level, I don't expect you to remember this. There's another, um, another series of parameters you can get um, called R squareds and Q squareds out of doing, a, doing an analysis like this. Um, why don't I spend a minute or two telling you this and not do the final example? So the strategy for, so don't worry, I mean, this would never come up on an exam because I'm going off a piece here. The strategy for knowing whether or not this sort of result is a robust result or not, is you have to do something called internal cross-validation. So the way that we've arrived at this particular plot is we've told it that each and every one of these samples is a black triangle, so this is um, in this group. Let's call this group one for simplicity, and this is group two. Forget number 24. This is group two. If we give it all the data go off and find the difference between group one and group two, it can do that. And it shows this result here. What you want to do to be much more robust than that is this thing called internal cross-validation. So you don't do this in initial model building based upon all the available data. You would leave out, how many data points? Five, 10, 15, 18. In that case, probably you would leave out about five, six, or seven randomly selected samples from this study. So imagine that five or six or seven of these are randomly left out. You would build a model with the data, the bulk of the data that you've got, and imagine it looks a bit like that. The ones that you left out, you deliberately left out some black ones, and you deliberately left out some white ones. Where does the model that you've just built predict where the black ones are and where the white ones are. If, when you add in the ones you left out, if the black ones appear here and the white ones appear here, that means the model's good. It means that the model you built on a smaller portion of the data stands up, and when you put back in the ones you left out, they're in the right groups. You don't do that once. You actually do that multiple, multiple, multiple times and you get results out that tell you around the quality of that internal validation. Um, so, yeah, you do it again, you leave out another bunch of red, uh, sorry, not red, black and white ones, different ones, build a new model, predict where they should be, and so on. So, yeah, I mean, probably not surprising to you, there's always a lot more devil in the detail than I would present or somebody would present in a in a lecture. So overfitting on these sorts of models is, is relatively, um, there have been papers written on how to avoid overfitting on this sort of approach. So I'm, I'm glad that, that that point was raised. So I will finish this example, because remember this example was about discovering something new about the mechanism. A um, couple more slides on this. So this is Again, this is this Daphnia, this toxicology copper study. 
And there's lots of metabolites here, and there's all sorts of changes in p-values. And you can see, again, I'm pulling it up, because look, what sort of analysis are we now using? Univariate with false discovery rate correction. So in those two slides, this one and the previous one, we've used univariate statistics, multivariate, both supervised and unsupervised. And we do genuinely apply, in our research, we apply a range of different statistical methods. And we're actually, it's kind of like looking at the puzzle from different perspectives. And ideally, we're going to see consistency in these different sets of statistical analysis to make us feel more confident. Amongst all the changes, because this is a long old list of amino acids, and, um, there was this interesting change in a molecule called N-acetylspermidine, uh, which happens to have this, this chemical formula. It underwent, when exposed to copper, a three-fold increase and the p-value was 10 to the minus 5. So, you know, this is a small p-value. So it's a big change. Metabolically, this is a big change. It's significant. So what is it? What's N-acetylspermidine um, changing? Why is it changing in response to the copper? So from... You, you can't discover everything immediately from an omics experiment, as I was pointing out this morning. Now, this is going to be... I'll have to read, read a couple of things out on here. This is from, this is a metabolic pathway. And N-acetylspermidine is here, and it's, it's got an export pump. So N-acetylspermidine sits here. Where does this metabolite come from? It's produced from spermidine. Spermidine is a, is a polyamine. And what converts that spermidine to N-acetylspermidine is this enzyme called SSAT. So, all we've got from the metabolomics is this compound N-acetylspermidine has changed concentration. Off to the literature. This enzyme, SSAT, which stands for spermidine spermine N-acetyltransferase, that is actually the rate-limiting enzyme in the breakdown of spermidine. So, that enzyme is rate-limiting in the breakdown of this metabolite. What's known about this enzyme? It's known to increase in response to free radical producing toxicants. What's copper? Copper causes oxidative stress. Copper causes free radicals. Didn't measure it in this study, but copper can cause free radicals. And so now the hypothesis is, because we're generating hypotheses from omics data, the hypothesis is copper causes oxidative stress, causes free radicals. This, based upon literature, creates an increase in activity of this SSAT. This SSAT is rate-limiting for the conversion of spermidine to N-acetylspermidine. So as the copper acts on this, um, and this is, this is increasing its rate, we increase the rate of production of N-acetylspermidine. So there is a very specific biochemical pathway with using knowledge, prevailing knowledge from the literature coupled to a completely non-targeted metabolomic study that revealed this change, and we've developed a hypothesis. So what are we going to do now? Well, if you want to prove that hypothesis, you're going to go back and you're going to do a targeted investigation. You're probably going to have a, a method, ideally quantitative method, that measures spermidine, measures an acetyl spermidine. You might even want to do something with the enzyme itself. Maybe you want to have an enzyme assay for SSAT. And you go to a targeted study on Daphne or copper, measure a couple of metabolites and an enzyme, and you would be able to definitively prove that there is, in fact, a, a perturbation to this part of the pathway. Is it critical? Is it really important in, in, in the toxicological response? I don't know, but it was certainly one of the larger fold changes and one of the more significant effects. So... Out of, all the met out of all the metabolism that was probed, it certainly sort of shone out as an important part of metabolism. So hopefully, because I think that will be the last slide, if I, well, other than the conclusions on that one, because I'm not going to do that. Um, and that, that's fine. It, I think uh, that's a specific conclusion to the study. The generic conclusion is... Going back to that slide, which I said probably is one of the most important slides in lecture one, which is the way that we use omics technologies to discover 
biological processes, biochemical processes. We let the data advise us on what's happening. So we mine the data, we, 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 we come up with the, with the information such as this, because nobody would have thought to study in acetylspermidine. So we allow the data to speak for itself and advise us on where to go, and now we, we um, build hypotheses and we test specific pathways. And if we had done that, and, and I'm not aware that anybody has done that follow-up experiment, but hopefully that follow-up experiment will be done with the right level of replication, quantification, and so on, to derive a definitive mechanistic um, piece of the puzzle, if you will, of how copper is interacting with this organism. So that's how you use omics data to translate to um, classical hypothesis-driven science. So I won't do the final example. I'm a couple of minutes over in any case. So any final questions? And if not, then hopefully, hopefully if you go to the literature and, and you're interested enough to read a, a metabolomics paper or, or two, that you would at least understand the methodologies that we use and the sorts of questions and why we use such a wonderful technique like metabolomics. All right, thank you.